Hello, I'm Dr. Nina Kim from the University of Washington. Today, I will be discussing hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, in the setting of chronic hepatitis B infection. In this mini lecture, I will take a brief moment to go over the terminology of liver cancer. I will then review the global epidemiology before touching on related mortality in the US. Hepatitis B has distinct features that promote the pathogenesis of HCC, and we will review that as well. I will discuss the evidence base to support HCC screening, and finally, review the indications for screening, specifically who to screen, as well as the available and recommended methods of screening, specifically how to screen. Primary liver cancer refers to malignant tumors that arise from within the organ itself rather than from distant metastases. There are three forms of primary liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, originating from hepatocytes, cholangiocarcinoma, originating from biliary cells or cholangiocytes, and a rare form of combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma. HCC is responsible for the vast majority of primary liver cancer at 85 to 90% and will be the focus of this talk. Primary liver cancer of any cause, whether it is due to chronic hepatitis B or another, is a leading cancer worldwide and ranks sixth on highest incidence of cancers according to the World Health Organization in 2020. It can be a lethal cancer and is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide, surpassed only by lung and colorectal cancers. The incidence of HCC has tripled in the last few decades in the United States, and because of the lethal nature of this cancer, the mortality trends have matched the incidence, as you can see here. The overall five-year survival is 21% according to the 2020 U.S. SEER data collected by the National Cancer Institute. The burden of hepatocellular carcinoma can also be viewed from this graphic from the World Health Organization Global Hepatitis Report. You can see that chronic hepatitis B carries the lion's share of deaths attributable to viral hepatitis, and that among causes of death, HCC has a sizable contribution at over a third of HBV-associated deaths. Hepatitis B virus can promote hepatocarcinogenesis through multiple mechanisms. Like chronic hepatitis C, HBV can contribute to cancer development via the fibrotic pathway with chronic inflammation, recurrent hepatic injury, and cell turnover. But unlike hepatitis C, HBV can integrate itself into the host genome and in doing so cause genomic instability as well as gene products like the HBX protein that have distinct oncogenic potential. So this is why hepatitis B can promote liver cancer, even in the absence of cirrhosis, although the vast majority of HCC cases from hepatitis B are in patients with advanced fibrosis. As for evidence to support HCC screening, the best known study is a cluster randomized control trial conducted in China that assessed the impact of screening on HCC-related mortality. This study enrolled over 18,000 individuals with chronic hepatitis B, aged 35 to 59, from 300 factories, businesses, and schools in urban Shanghai. Half of these units were randomized to screening using serum alpha feta protein and ultrasound every six months. The other arm underwent usual care without screening. One of the most notable outcomes was that HCC was diagnosed at an earlier stage in the screened group, as shown here. Ultimately, the screening group had a lower HCC-related five-year mortality rate compared with the control group. There were some methodologic flaws to the study that placed it at risk for bias that I won't go into, but there have been several observational studies of patients with cirrhosis that have since shown that surveillance for HCC is associated with early-stage tumor detection and improved survival, even after adjusting for measurable confounding factors. The American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases or AASLD, recommends HCC screening for the following people with chronic hepatitis B, all persons with cirrhosis. This remains one of the strongest risk factors for HCC among people with hepatitis B. The HCC incidence in persons with cirrhosis is estimated to be 2 to 4 per 100 person years versus 0.1 to 0.8 per 100 person years in those without. Among those without cirrhosis, there are some groups that are recommended to undergo screening based on age and country of origin. These individuals carry a higher risk for HCC due to viral host and epigenetic factors. Patients with a family history of HCC, specifically in a first-degree family member, parent or sibling, 
should also be considered for screening. The PHB score, which includes platelet count, age, and sex, has been validated in Western populations on antiviral therapy and could also be used to assess the HCC risk. There are a variety of other factors related to the host, the disease and virus, and environmental exposures listed here that are mentioned in the AASLD guidance that contribute to HCC risk and are worth considering as there is room for individualization when considering the decision to screen. But the aforementioned groups of individuals are the main indications for screening in the setting of chronic hepatitis B. The main modality that's recommended for HCC screening is an abdominal ultrasound every six months. Unlike cross-sectional imaging, such as contrast-enhanced CT or MRI, it has the advantage of being readily available and relatively inexpensive. However, it is operator-dependent with a sensitivity that is not quite as high as one would ideally like for a screening test, ranging anywhere from 40 to 80%. This variability is due in large part to who you are screening. Ultrasound can have lower sensitivity in patients with large body habitus or who cannot hold their breath, or have significant nodularity or background echogenicity or brightness in their liver. When it comes to biomarkers for HCC screening, serum alpha fetoprotein is the main one that has been used and studied. I will not discuss newer biomarkers since we have less data to support their use, and none of these are currently endorsed by professional societies or guidelines. Like ultrasound, serum AFP has the advantage of being readily available and easy to perform. But like ultrasound, when used alone, it also has suboptimal sensitivity and specificity depending on the cutoff value you select. Using a threshold value of greater than 20 nanogram per mil for detecting HCC, this test has a sensitivity of only 60%. There has been debate over the incremental benefit of adding AFP to ultrasound. As you can see, there's some difference in guidance recommendations. The AASLD historically left the addition of AFP to ultrasound to the clinician, but in their recent 2023 HCC guidance, they switched to endorsing the use of both due to data indicating slight improvement in sensitivity with the addition of AFP to ultrasound. So in summary, HCC is a leading cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide, and much of it is related to hepatitis B. The overall five-year survival in the United States is approximately 20%. Survival depends on the stage of HCC at the time of diagnosis, with a poor prognosis for those with advanced or metastatic HCC. The primary goal of surveillance is to detect disease at an early stage and therefore increase the likelihood of potentially curative therapy. Cirrhosis remains a consensus indication for HCC screening. Other indications per AASLD include factors determined by age, race, country of origin, and family history. The recommended HCC screening method is hepatic ultrasound every six months with serum alpha fetoprotein. To learn more about hepatitis B, please check out our hepatitis B online curriculum, which contains a variety of lessons, cases, and slides to reinforce your knowledge. Thanks for joining me today. The production of this Hepatitis B online mini-lecture was supported by funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.